Hey everyone, I'm going to start out 2017 by diving into a topic I've been putting off for far too long. In part because the transgender community is so psychotic, it hardly seems worth the effort to try talking sense to them. But we have to. One of the big social issues near the end of 2016 was the inclusion of gender identity and gender expression into protected categories of the Canadian Charter of Human Rights. University of Toronto professor Jordan Peterson publicly refused to accept this addition, called Bill C-16, mostly on the grounds that forcing people's speech to include imaginary pronouns supports a toxic ideology and is authoritarian. It's also dangerous because trans identities are fantasy. Transgender is not a healthy identity, their assertions are not supported by science, and we should not normalize a pathological condition. I'm going to give links below to a recent report published in the fall of 2016 which concludes, in part 3 on gender identity, the hypothesis that gender identity is an innate, fixed property of human beings that is independent of biological sex, in other words, that a person might be a man trapped in a woman's body, or a woman trapped in a man's body, is not supported by scientific evidence. According to a recent estimate, about 0.6% of U.S. adults identify as a gender that does not correspond to their biological sex. Studies comparing the brain structures of transgender and non-transgender individuals have demonstrated weak correlations between brain structure and cross-gender identification. These correlations do not provide any evidence for a neurobiological basis for cross-gender identification. Compared to the general population, adults who have undergone sex reassignment surgery continue to have a higher risk of experiencing poor mental health outcomes. One study found that compared to controls, sex reassigned individuals were about five times more likely to attempt suicide and about 19 times more likely to die by suicide. Children are a special case when addressing transgender issues. Only a minority of children who experience cross-gender identification will continue to do so into adolescence or adulthood. There is little scientific evidence for the therapeutic value of interventions that delay puberty or modify the secondary sex characteristics of adolescents although some children may have improved psychological well-being if they're encouraged and supported in their cross-gender identification. There is no evidence that all children who express gender atypical thoughts or behavior should be encouraged to become transgender. Transgender spectrum people suffer from a mental illness, and instead of treating it as such, we've chosen instead to indulge their delusions. We need to be concerned with medical ethics and responsibility, but instead, we're turning the attempt to help these people into a hate crime. Well, what's more hateful? Trying to help the mentally ill adapt or creating more mental illness? Of course, the assertion that gender dysphoria is not a mental illness comes from the mentally ill themselves, and they think they've got all the answers. Non-binary people fall under the umbrella term trans, which refers to anyone whose gender doesn't match what they were assigned at birth. Often, the main thing I hear people cite to deny our existence is science. Yep. Science. She's a bitch. As someone who genuinely loves science, it sucks to see people trying to use it to erase the existence of others, especially when there is plenty of science to suggest the opposite. At no point in the rest of his videos does this gentleman actually give any scientific research. He just says it exists. So next we have two non-binary snowflakes who claim that they're going to rebut myths. To send me some stereotypes and misconceptions about trans people, we are going to debunk them right here, right now. Some people think transgender people are mentally disturbed or have some sort of mental illness. My dad says this. I get this. But, um, being transgender is a mental condition, and it's not a mental illness or a condition. Gender is mental, but it's not like something bad. My mom doesn't think, my mom doesn't think it's a mental illness. She just thinks that a therapy would help me realize who I really am. <laughs> Their parents are right. The only rebuttal they have is they laugh and say, uh, no, and this is what they say therapy should look like. But when you think the therapy is like, if you go to the right therapist, they'll be like, heck yeah, let me get you some hormones. Yeah, let me get you some tea here, buddy, here you go. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's what's going on. 
kids who say they're dysphoric are put on hormones almost right away. She says, let me get you some tea, as if it's, you know, just like taking vitamins. They think their delusions are real because of the therapists who are enabling them. Psychiatrists prescribing hormones to these children and promoting trans culture as a positive phenomenon need to have their licenses revoked. One of these irresponsible people is Dr. Margaret Nichols. <laughs> I'm Margie Nichols. I'm a sex therapist, a psychologist, and I'm the director of a psychotherapy agency here in Jersey City called the Institute for Personal Growth. We'll compare Nichols' credentials to those writing the report in a moment. She talks about the sudden influx of trans people as if it's a good thing, but she also gives us an indication of where it's coming from. Transgender children were considered so rare that there were only a few clinics in the whole world that worked with them. And female to male, biological women that wanted to become males were also unheard of. Then in the late 90s, we started seeing a dramatic change. We started seeing college students that were coming out as transgender. Many of them were biological females uh, transitioning to male, in fact, often more of them. Um, and we also started hearing terms like genderqueer, identities that really we had never heard of before. Okay, so this started in university, according to her. If so, then something is going on at the universities that's getting people confused about their gender. We need to investigate that. One more thing from Nichols, she gives a personal anecdote about her own adopted son who wanted to wear a pink skirt. He wanted to wear a pink skirt. Now, Nancy and I are feminists. We didn't have a problem with him wearing a pink skirt. But back in the 1980s, we were a lesbian couple raising a child. It was widely believed that gay parents were gonna totally screw their kids up. And so there was no question of us allowing Corey to wear a pink skirt in public or to wear it in school. She and her partner only allowed him to wear it in private settings. And miraculously, she tells us this. Everybody thought he was adorable. And by the end of the summer, he'd sort of lost interest in wearing a pink skirt. And Nancy and I were very lucky that we dodged a huge bullet, because if we had dared support him as a gender variant child back then, we would have probably lost custody of him. Yes, he grew out of it, as about 80% of children do. But somehow she sees this as the incorrect way to deal with such delusions today, even when her own experience showed that it was best to not encourage her son's behavior. So this is what a real doctor looks like. Dr. Paul R. McHugh, former chief of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins, has written numerous articles about the danger of transgender activist demands. Dr. McHugh shut down the reassignment clinic at Johns Hopkins in 1976, when post-operative studies showed that it did not improve the outcome for people with gender dysphoria. At about 10 years post-op, people who go through with the surgery have 20 times the suicide rates of those who do not. Despite his stellar credentials and having been a pioneer in gender reassignment surgery in the 1960s, trans activists have labeled Dr. McHugh a transphobic bigot. McHugh, if you remember, actually ran a major clinic for gender dysphoric people, and he describes transgender as a disorder of assumption, rather like anorexia. The transgendered suffer a disorder of assumption, like those in other disorders familiar to psychiatrists. With the transgendered, the disordered assumption is that the individual differs from what seems given in nature, namely one's maleness or femaleness. Other kinds of disordered assumptions are held by those who suffer from anorexia and bulimia nervosa, where the assumption that departs from physical reality is the belief by the dangerously thin that they're overweight. McHugh says elsewhere that granting gender reassignment surgery to transgendered people is like giving liposuction to an anorexic. Think about that. It's actually a really great analogy. Now, Dr. McHugh teamed up with Dr. Lawrence S. Mayer and published a report in the New Atlantis in fall of 2016 called Sexuality and Gender, Findings from the Biological, Psychological, and Social Sciences. I'll link to the report in the description, but I just want to focus on a couple of things from the intro. Dr. Mayer says, in the course of writing this report, I consulted a number of individuals who asked that I not thank them by name. Some feared an angry response from the more militant elements of the LGBT community. 
Others feared an angry response from the more strident elements of religiously conservative communities. Most bothersome, however, is that some feared reprisals from their own universities for engaging in controversial topics, regardless of the report's content. A sad statement about academic freedom. This is a grounded fear. With the new additions to the Charter, doctors and academics can be charged with violating Charter rights if they refuse to offer a patient the treatment that the patient demands. Now think about that. The Charter now ensures that mentally ill people can A. diagnose themselves with a medical condition and B. demand drugs from doctors. If a doctor refuses, they'll likely be charged with a rights violation. Charter activists use Section 15 of the Canadian Human Rights Charter for social engineering. You won't hear these activists use the term social engineering. They'll talk about equality and oppression, phobias, misogyny, and heteronormativity. Feminists use groups like the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund to litigate social change into society through the court system. And trans activists will do the same. They've discovered that litigation is more effective than political lobby groups. While the activists are mostly composed of the mentally ill themselves, and parents who are likely guilty of Munchausen syndrome by proxy, you know, they turn their children into special snowflakes to get attention as the tolerant and wise caregiver, I urge you to compare their credentials to that of Dr. Lawrence S. Mayer. I agreed to take over as lead author, rewriting, reorganizing, and expanding the text. I support every sentence in this report, without reservation and without prejudice regarding any political or philosophical debates. This report is about science and medicine, nothing more and nothing less. Readers wondering about this report's synthesis of research from so many different fields may wish to know a little about its lead author. I'm a full-time academic involved in all aspects of teaching, research, and professional service. I am a biostatistician and epidemiologist who focuses on the design, analysis, and interpretation of experimental and observational data in public health and medicine, particularly when the data are complex in terms of underlying scientific issues. I am a research physician, having trained in medicine and psychiatry in the UK, and received the British equivalent, MB, to the American MD. I have never practiced medicine, including psychiatry, in the United States or abroad. I have testified in dozens of federal and state legal proceedings and regulatory hearings, in most cases reviewing scientific literature to clarify the issues under examination. I strongly support equality and oppose discrimination for the LGBT community, and I have testified on their behalf as a statistical expert. I've been a full-time tenured professor for over four decades. I have held professorial appointments at eight universities, including Princeton, the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, Arizona State University, Johns Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health and School of Medicine, Ohio State, Virginia Tech, and the University of Michigan. I've also held research faculty appointments at several other institutions, including the Mayo Clinic. My full-time and part-time appointments have been in 23 disciplines, including statistics, biostatistics, epidemiology, public health, social methodology, psychiatry, mathematics, sociology, political science, economics, and biomedical informatics. But my research interests have varied far less than my academic appointments. The focus of my career has been to learn how statistics and models are employed across disciplines, with the goal of improving the use of models and data analytics in assessing issues of interest in the policy, regulatory, or legal realms. I have been published in many top-tier peer-reviewed journals, including the Annals of Statistics, Biometrics, and American Journal of Political Science and have reviewed hundreds of manuscripts submitted for publication to many of the major medical, statistical, and epidemiological journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Statistical Association, and American Journal of Public Health. I am currently a scholar in residence in the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and a professor of statistics and biostatistics at Arizona State University. Up until July 1, 2016, I also held part-time faculty appointments in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and School of Medicine, and at the Mayo Clinic. Often, the main thing I hear people cite to deny our existence is science. So, if your child is experiencing gender dysphoria, who are you going to call? Who do you trust more? It is not compassionate to encourage the delusions of a mentally ill person. 
It is not compassionate to put children on hormones that can sterilize them or to encourage them to cut off healthy body parts when these actions will increase the likelihood of suicide later in life. It is not compassionate to lie about scientific findings, putting self-mutilating behavior on a pedestal and encouraging the destruction of an entire generation. Compassion means telling people the truth even when they don't want to hear it. And the truth the trans community needs to hear is that they're wrong. They were not born this way. I'll show you what true compassion looks like. The editor's note from the New Atlantis article. Questions related to sexuality and gender bear on some of the most intimate and personal aspects of human life. In recent years, they have also vexed American politics. We offer this report written by Dr. Lawrence S. Mayer, an epidemiologist trained in psychiatry, and Dr. Paul R. McHugh, arguably the most important American psychiatrist of the last half century, in the hope of improving public understanding of these questions. Examining research from the biological, psychological, and social sciences, this report shows that some of the most frequently heard claims about sexuality and gender are not supported by scientific evidence. The report has a special focus on the higher rates of mental health problems among LGBT populations, and it questions the scientific basis of trends in the treatment of children who do not identify with their biological sex. More effort is called for to provide these people with the understanding, care, and support that they need to lead healthy, flourishing lives. In essence, the Canadian government needs to repeal Bill C-16 because children's lives are being destroyed and 40% of them are probably going to die if we let this insanity continue. We need to stop before our future looks like this. I identify as Nutois transgender. Our transgender Nutois 